Would you just lift your hands with me right now and begin to ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus right now. We thank you for the anointing of the Spirit. We thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the demonstration of your Spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. We thank you for everything you're going to do. You've brought people here from different locations today, and we bless you in Jesus' name. We thank you in Jesus' name. We pray, God, that the anointing will, will minister and will break the yoke, and in many, many people are going to be touched and helped in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a real praise. Come on, and a shout. Let's give the Lord a real praise and a shout out of our heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your help. Oh, my, my. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your blessing. Pam, while a few others come in, I need somebody to bring your phone and, and, and let's, let me talk and you can make, make a little video here. Can you do that? Uh, can he do on his? Uh, do you do live? Well, let's do a lot. Come on up here on the platform. Keep standing uh, because we do, people are, that can't come are always saying, send us some information, tell us what's going on. So we're going to do that here if Dustin can get a, get a signal. And uh, you just don't know how much I appreciate you being here. How many of you know that the Prophetic Summit's coming up next month? Boy, I have never seen so many people wanting to come to Cleveland, Tennessee to hear me preach. No, it's not me. <laughs> They're really saying, is Jimmy Evans really coming? Oh, my goodness, is Lance really, Lance is really coming? Yeah, they're really coming. That's the, there's, that's the plan. So if you, if you did not get registered, we're full, but we have cancellations. And when you get a cancellation, Andrea can put you in when the cancellation comes. So we'll have more cancellations. And I hate the storm, but storms like that create cancellations too because people can't come. And we just feel, feel pity for the people that had to go through that uh, a tornado the other day. It's just unbelievable what the, the, the damage that, that does. You, can you get it? All right. Now, you, I want you to take your time, show, you, show these wonderful people here. All right. Hello, everybody. Are we live? Oh, we're actually live. Well, that means that some of you is going to hear your, your phone or computer go ding, 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 and it's not something bad happening. It's not a storm alert. It is a Perry Stone alert when you hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now what we're going to do tonight, and I'll share this for the people that are here, is uh, something is happening in the United States that I, has not happened in my lifetime. Right now, Tony Scott told me yesterday, 60 secular universities, most of these are not Christian universities, are now having outbreaks of prayer meetings and revivals. 60. 60 in the United States. Now that, amen, that's, we need to shout for that, all right? The second, the second thing that's interesting is Jensen Franklin had God visit him in Israel when it was raining. I want Jensen to tell this, not me. And the Lord told him it was coming. This is a few years ago, that it's coming, that the, the stadiums would be filled of people and there would be a lot of young people coming to receive, be filled with the Spirit. And now they're booking stadiums in some of these states. And um, the, uh, what the Lord told him about the sign that would bring this revival in hadn't even happened yet. So we're, we're really into something. But here's what I want to tell you about today in the next few minutes. And uh, revival, God's warning to the nations. This is the part that people miss. We, we're going to talk about this, and hopefully with the help of the Lord, I want, I want him to, to, give, uh, to give this I want him to give this to you the way that it came to me. Uh, Pam and I were on the islands of, uh, in Hawaii, and I was really getting stirred up in this, and I would just sit in that room sometimes and go out on the balcony, and I would hear the Lord tell me that revival is more than reviving people or getting people saved. And I'm going to show you what happens either before, during, or right after a revival breaks. And I studied this very carefully because I don't want to ever present something to any of you who are here that would, uh, would not be accurate because some of this stuff has to be dug out through history and some of it has to be dug out through research of the, of the Word of God. So uh, we wish we could stay on Facebook Live, but we can't. Because Dustin is a security person that has to handle seating and anything that happens like that. But everybody, let's just give the Lord a clap, and he's going to give one more scan. Thank you for joining us. And uh, hallelujah. Come on. Right here in Cleveland, Tennessee. 
the hub of the end time revival. Come on, somebody. Yes, 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 we believe it. We believe it. Amen, amen, amen. I don't know. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm going to have to jump up and preach this one. Praise God. But we're going to do what Jesus did because the Bible says he sat and taught them. They had a seat called Moses' seat. And um, it wasn't really Moses' seat. It was made out of stone. And they would open the scroll. He'd take a seat and he would teach them. I want to first begin by saying this to you. That in my opinion, there are three manifestations of God for the church and for the earth, three different types that have happened through history. And there's many manifestations. There's nine gifts of the Spirit. We're not talking about that level. Here's what we're talking about. When it comes to God moving on the earth to win people, to get people saved, to bring them in the kingdom, to fill them with the Spirit, to bring divine healing, it goes into three levels. Revivals, awakenings, and outpourings. Many times... People will confuse an awakening to a revival. If people start having prayer meetings where thousands show up, it doesn't mean it's a revival. It's an awakening. A revival has to have people being saved before it is a revival. Brownsville revival was not an awakening. It was not even an outpouring. It was a revival. How do I know? Because I knew Steve Hill personally. I wrote the last forward to Steve Hill's book before he passed away, the evangelist of the Brownsville Revival. Great friend. And Steve's biggest thing was people getting saved. Check out any night Steve preached on the internet, and it was for one reason, to get people saved and get them in the altar. Now, once people were saved... People would begin to be filled with the Spirit. Some would receive healing and great prayer would break out. But the whole revival was built on people coming to know the Lord. So a revival is a reviving of something that's dying. I'm going to tell you, every church in America needs a revival. Even the ones that are doing well. We need to be revived out of our slumber. And so then we have awakenings. Now an awakening... A revival can affect an area, but an awakening will literally impact either a state, a county, a region, or an entire nation. And awakenings are a combination of where God starts reviving the spirits of the people, but a revival is more on individuals being touched that have come together. An awakening is a massive amount of people in an area suddenly turning to God. Years ago, Billy Graham had what he called revivals, but really many times they were awakenings because all of New York was being stirred. Some, uh, he, he would preach outside and there'd be 50 to 100,000 people in New York suddenly starting to pray and turn, turn, their, turn their hearts to the Lord. Then there's what's called outpourings. And outpourings are when the Holy Spirit shows up in a moment of history or a season And he begins to restore to the church gifts that have been dormant. Someone said the gifts that have been dead. The gifts can't die because they come from God and God has life and the life of God will never die. That's why you're an eternal being because you have a spirit God breathed in you and God's breath can never die. So in other words, an outpouring centers on the Holy Spirit himself doing something to where there is a return of either vocal gifts, miraculous gifts, the gift of healing, the gift of faith, or whatever the case may be. I look through the Bible, and there's, you know, different people would differ with me on this, but there have been five major revivals in the Bible. There was a revival in Israel under King Hezekiah, under King Josiah. There was a revival under Nehemiah who said, revive your work in the midst of these years. Then we find out that there was a revival under the prophet Elijah and there was a revival in Samaria in the book of Acts that took the entire city into the kingdom of God, practically all the people. There were five revivals. There was one major awakening. and I, Now, there's, there can be many, many minor ones, but there was one major awakening in Scripture and that is when the city of Nineveh, a pagan city, was going to be destroyed in 40 days The population was probably around 150,000 people and the whole, whole city woke up. 
And the king woke up and the kids woke up and we're talking about waking up spiritually and they came to the Lord. We find out that in scripture, there is one major outpouring. Now, there were many times that the Holy Spirit through a revival, Acts 19 is an example, uh, Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius is an example, when there would be a secluded, limited moving of the Spirit where families or, or people in, a, in, an, in one area would receive the Holy Spirit. But the greatest outpouring in the church was the day of Pentecost. When 16 nations are at the festival, 3,000 are saved for the very first time and baptized in water, that would be an outpouring. They didn't know what was coming. My God. They're sitting there in the upper room minding their business, and that quick, God comes out of heaven and shows up with tongues of fire, and they speak in tongues, and Thomas come jumping out, Mary come rolling out, you know. Uh, I mean, all these people start manifesting the power and the great glory of the Lord. Now, in America, and this is important, I want you to get this, those of you that may be uh, watching this later, and the reason we don't put this up live is because I, I may say something I want edited out. <laughs> So if you ever want to know why, why don't you just do this live? That's the reason why. And then sometimes I'll say something that the social media algorithm AI computer wants to cut me off and then you, you don't get to hear anything. So that's why we do this this way. Uh, the United States has revival come about every 20 years. There is a cycle, and this is really since, since Azusa Street. So about every 20 years, you'll find a city, a state, an area where you will hear about a great revival breaking out in some location. As far as awakenings, there have been, some count three, some count four, I count five. There's been at least, at least in my opinion, five awakenings. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, the first great awakening, and there were other great awakenings in history, but five have come, and they tend to follow a pattern of their own. We're going we're to get into this because I believe what I'm about to tell you today if you can get this in your spirit, it's going to set the, the foundation for what God wants to do in your area and what he's going to do in Cleveland, Tennessee. I want to remind you that this whole city has a prophecy on it and the enemy has done everything he can to stop it, but you can't stop a prophetic word when God's ready to fulfill it. I'm telling you right now, God will, God will bang on the gates of hell and tear them down before he'll let the enemy do what he it wants to do again. Oh, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. Glory to his name. Anyway, so there, uh, <laughs> there's been five awakenings. There have been four in the United States major outpourings. Now, again, there's been some smaller ones, some minor ones from time to time, even through history. But here they are. 1898 in Murphy, North Carolina, with a group of Baptists. I'm telling you, the Baptists are always doing something for God, aren't they? This was a group of Baptist preachers who were in the holiness movement right down the road, 40 miles away, and they got hungry for God, and they, they, they just had a prayer meeting and started doing something. They didn't know what they were doing. They started speaking in tongues and found out later it was in the Bible. And, of course, they went under great persecution after that happened, and, uh, and, and the Church of God denomination that you see here headquartered in Cleveland was born out of those preachers from Murphy, North Carolina. I'm not sure if you knew that or not. So that was, that's really a, a great, great, great outpouring that did not get into history books a lot. Now, the reason Murphy, North Carolina's outpouring did not make it like Azusa Street was one, Azusa Street went on a lot longer. Number two, Azusa Street was international. And number three, they had something called the Los Angeles paper reporting it all the time. So when you have a big paper reporting it, it will get known around the United States faster than up in the mountains of North Carolina. Now, in second outpouring was in 1900 in Kansas when, from, when, when, when the new year came in, they had a prayer meeting at a Bible school. It was in a house, a lot of young people. And a girl named Agnes began to speak in tongues right at the beginning of the new year. And that started the second wave of the outpouring in Kansas uh, up in the state of Kansas. Now, after that, in 1906, which was about five years later, here's what you got to remember, though. All these are interconnected. What do I mean? Somebody here 
from North Carolina goes up into Kansas and starts telling them about the speaking in tongues. Somebody in Kansas got, got filled and they go down to Texas and then a guy named Seymour in Texas ends up at Azusa Street. So these are not like separate outpourings where nobody knows what's going on. They're hearing about this uh, as, as, as it's happening throughout these years. 1906, the uh, Los Angeles, California, the Azusa Street Revival. We'll talk about what triggered that in a minute. Then in 1967, there was the charismatic renewal in which uh, Notre Dame University, Catherine Kuhlman uh, was a part of that up in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Kath Catherine had huge crowds and many miracles. But those particular outpourings of the Spirit that began to take place during that time that we just mentioned uh, featured... Every one of them featured the vocal gifts. Every one of them featured tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Uh, and so that's what I want to point out that there, when these happens, how do these occur? Because I want to know, look, I'm, I'm not too old to have another long revival somewhere. Come on, help me preach somebody. No, I'm not too old. I've just learned how to chill out in the Lord. No, actually, I've learned how to do what Kenneth Hagin didn't take a nap every day about an hour. And then you can make it all night long in a prayer meeting or with a group of people. Now, some of you young people are laughing at me. Your day is coming, Nick Walker. I just want, I want you to know whether, whether you believe it or not. Listen to your dad. Listen to your spiritual dad here, Nick. It's coming to you one day. Now, how do these three things occur? Number one, revival will occur after many, many years of consistent prayer. Now, I'm going to... God, I felt the Holy Spirit right there. Glory to your name, Jesus. Woo! I'm going to tell you why I know this city will be targeted one day for a major revival. It may be in a big tent. It may just be on the streets. But it's, it's going to happen because this group here that you are sitting among, and I would probably be one of the few that's remaining from that original group because they've moved or now have gone into other places. But I remember when we started a prayer meeting in a barn. Now, now William, you were there then. We started a prayer meeting in a, not a bar. Let's get, Granny, get your hearing aids up. Barn, B-A-R-N, and not bar. And so I cut my letters off sometimes. That's why I said that. And so we prayed every Thursday. We still pray every Thursday. Can I just announce to all of you faithful prayer people, it is impossible to pray for 11 years every Thursday for one hour without angels of God and the court of heaven getting attention that, something, that, those, that those people are serious about what they want God to do. The OCI building was paid for because of prayer, $22 million. Everything that's happened there has happened, whether it's Karen's uh, meetings, Karen's ramp, Warrior Fest, Bill Clouds, special things he does, the prophetic summit, these, the, the, you know, tens of thousands of people that come into this town all because of, a, of what God is doing here. Let me tell you, you cannot pray the way that we have been praying without God hearing it and something will break out. What is an awakening? How do awakenings happen? If you ever go to what's called the Welch Revival with that uh, Robert Evans or the Evans boy that started that, he, it was travail. It was misery. He was miserable. He was unhappy. He did not like the, the deadness that was in the church. And for years, he travailed. Real awakenings come when the saints of God get under a burden and they consistently travail before God. So revival comes through steadfast prayer, but an awakening, which is a whole nother level of reaching a whole city, town, or state, comes through the travail of the spirit of the people of God. And outpouring can be prayed in, but I want to say something about outpourings because I've been in them. They are more sovereign than they are anything else. Sometimes when an outpouring happens, you cannot trace your finger on why did it happen there. Won't it make sense? Or why did that church lead that? I mean, what, what, what's the deal? What's the connection? And you'll research it and you'll try to figure it out. And I think two things answer the question of why did God choose that place? Number one, God chose it because they were hungry. Let me tell you something. You can't feed the most delicious, expensive meal to somebody who won't eat. If they won't eat, save your food and your money. 
But God, and, and, he, and he, then number two, he chooses who is available. You know, in the Jesus Revolution movie, anybody seen that movie, Jesus Revolution? Can I recommend go see that? <laughs> My problem was I cried through the whole thing without a handkerchief. That was the worst part. Where do we see that at? We saw it at, we saw it at Dallas when we were with Joni, but just Pam and I went to see it. But it's a, tr it's a true story. It's not a fictitious story. Now, there's a man in there, and you heard his name named Lonnie. And, you know, we were talking this morning. Lonnie's wife, who still is alive, came out and talked about Lonnie having problems the entire time they were married and how he struggled, but how he loved God. He was trying to get the, do the best, and yet God used him to bring in 1,500 kids that started the Jesus Revolution. And we were, we were saying, how do you explain that someone like Lonnie could have such a weakness, and I don't want to go tell what about what it is, you know, because that's the past, and yet, yet go through cycles of this and end up falling and before he died, coming back to the Lord, and God used him. Let me tell you something. God used a donkey one time to get a preacher's attention. God used a rooster crowing one time to make Peter come to conviction. And I want to tell you, you know why God used Lonnie? Because Lonnie had a hunger for God. That's why God used him. And so anybody, you know, here's what we think. We think you got to have a super duper whooper whopper walking with God that's been on a 40-day fast and seen seven angels and 27 visitations from the Holy Ghost. And maybe that person can lead this revival. I'm going to tell you what God wants. God doesn't want one particular person to lead anything. Here's the reason why. Because too many times one particular person messed the whole thing up. What God wants is the entire church to get on fire. And he wants everybody to be a part of what he's going to do in the last days. And that's what he's looking for. But you have to be hungry. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. Every revival came either before, in the middle of, or shortly thereafter, a major crisis in the country. Now, Jonathan, can we get a wide view of this title? Revival, God's warning to the nations. Now, everybody listen, because I'm going to say this up front. Man, I, and I'm feeling the presence of God in me right now when I get ready to say this because I'm saying something prophetic and you can mark this down. If right now there are 60 universities and, and Tony Scott said this has been reported and investigated that there are that are having, now some of them aren't having like tens of thousands or thousands. It may be a hundred, two, five hundred, a thousand kids, but something's happening. If we have 60, I'm going to, I'm going to, Oh, I'm going to say something that's going to sound counter to the revival, but I'm giving you the reason for God doing it. First of all, God said sons and daughters will prophesy in the last revival. That's going to happen. So we are globally on the brink of, I really believe this, the Joel 2 revival Joel mentioned. We've talked about it for years, but eventually it's going to happen. But when God takes a nation and takes all of the young people and begins to touch their heart, remember me, what's the date today? March what? What time is it? Give me the exact time. I want somebody to write this in a notepad. I want you to get the exact date I said it. 3.26. Oh, oh, the time is 3.28. Write it down. In the United States... For God to stir up that many universities, we are going to have a national calamity in America that's going to take the lives of millions of people. You say, well, that's not good news. Let me tell you why it's good news. Because God's going to get a whole bunch of them saved before the calamity ever comes. The revivals will come before the calamity, sometimes in the middle of the calamity, Sometimes after the calamity. Now, I'm gonna, this is where I'm going to delve in a minute. And I know, you know, you say, well, I, well, that doesn't even make a lot of sense. It will when you hear what I'm about to tell you. And that's why you've got to pay very careful attention to, and hang on to every word because the Lord wanted me to preach this in preparation for what he's about to do. From 1730 to the year 1967, there are five major characteristics that the United States had 
before the outpouring, awakening, or revival happened. And it's, it's the same all through history. Number one, the passion for church attendance was lost and the attendance was low. Now, let me tell you, for all you COVID folks that haven't gone back to church yet, you better get off your you-know-what and get back in the house of God. God wants you to fellowship with people. Listen, you need to be with people. You need to be around people. If your kids and grandchildren see you laying out of church all the time, do you think they're going to be interested in ever going to church when they get older? I'm preaching this. It's quiet now. So you need to find something that you can connect to because you need it. Uh, it went down. I, I knew that wasn't going to go over. But I've had pastors. I, had a, I was with a pastor in Hawaii who told me, he said, I, I, you know, he's, let, well, I'm not going to, I shouldn't have said Hawaii. Let me, let, me t- let me take another example. I don't want to use them. Let me use somebody else. I had a pastor tell me that what he was running before COVID and he, half of his people live near the church, don't go to church, but watch him on the internet and send their tithe in, but half of them haven't come back yet. Yeah. Wow. Am I telling the truth, Pam? Have, have preachers told us that everywhere we've been? Raise your hand, baby, because they can't see you short. Okay. She's down in that seat. She's got to raise her hand. <laughs> Number two, people start having an interest in worldly things and no interest in spiritual things. I'm going to tell you what bothers me about Cleveland. Why you have to have sports on Sunday. And you got to fill ball fields on Sunday when most of the people have a church background. And you're taking all the kids out of the one day they go to church to play sports. I got news for you. I don't care if I had a kid or a grandbaby growing up that was going to be the next Tua Tonga Valoa and go to the Washington Redskins. I don't know why I've mentioned them. (laughs) They need help. But go to the Washington Redskins and be the quarterback. I do not want my children to to focus on something secular and grow up without an experience with God. I, lo- I like sports. I like going to them. But when it starts taking you away from God and away from church, something's got to give. That's old school. I know it is, but it's still true. So people's passion changed. Interest for going to church changed. This is, this, this is history. This, is what ha- this, this was the condition of America every time before revival, awakening, or some outpouring happened. People were focused on wealth and prosperity and success instead of walking close to God and were working seven days a week. People were compromising with sin and mixing truth with other non-biblical ideas. Now, we see that today where you take something that God is against and the church compromises it and says, yeah, but, well, that's old school. Yeah, but that's just from the Bible and the Bible's outdated. You see it happening all the time. Then the fifth thing is this. In those times before revival awakening or any type of an outpouring happened, the preachers behind the pulpit were dead spiritually. They had no unction to preach. They preached out of habit just to keep their people happy. And they refused to preach a message that stirred anything up. I get tickled at folks. I'll preach something. This happened my whole life. And somebody will email usually, you tell Perry Stone, I'm not giving him another penny after preaching like that. I'll say, look them up. What did they give? (laughs) What what did they give? Can I tell you 99% of the time, where's Susan? Susan, stand up, Susan. Everybody say, this is my bookkeeper. Susan, when we look them up, what do we find out about, let's say 90% of them after after telling me, what does they tell me? They don't give anything. They never gave a penny. They never gave a dime. They never ordered a book. What they're trying to do is use, it's the voice of the adversary, just like the adversary spoke to Peter to rebuke Jesus. It's the voice of the adversary saying, go threaten Perry Stone so he'll shut up. Let me tell you, I've been threatened enough times that if I was going to shut up, I'd I'd have sewed my lips up a long time ago. You cannot shut up a fireball Italian who's full of the Holy Ghost or a preacher, a preacher that's been to hell and back so many times that I can smell the smoke on my shirt. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Anyway, these five things were all common in the time that revivals and awakenings occurred. But 
Let's go here. This, this, now, this, what I'm about to tell you here is real interesting, and this is history. In the time of the colonies, how did the colonies, because that was a day when most folks were at least believed in God or were religious, but how did the colonies handle when they saw the people in this condition and they saw the attendance dropping off and they saw the people just taking Sunday as another day or, or whatever when they worshiped, what happened? Now, I'm going to share something with you that in my 46 years of preaching, I found out only two weeks ago. The ministers in the colonies could not figure out how to get people to come to church on Sunday because when they preached... They, they knew they couldn't get the people to repent and the people didn't want to repent, but the people wanted their children baptized in water. But technically, you couldn't have your children baptized in water unless mom and dad were converted to the Lord. So they developed, are y'all ready for this? They developed the halfway covenant. That's the name of it. They developed the halfway covenant. In the halfway covenant, a church member could come to church and baptize their children without ever confessing they were Christian. So what happened was you start having a church full of unrepentant, unredeemed people who all week long lived like the devil but Sunday came in like a saint and walked out and had not changed. But they did it because the attendants start picking up when they told the sinners. Now you can be a part, come and sign the paper for a halfway covenant. All you have to do, will baptize your kids and just, just acknowledge the church and come every now and then, but we're not going to force you to repent. That, you ready for this? According to history, that divided the church up completely. And I want you to listen to this. By 1742, in New England, the church was divided between the new lights and the old lights. That's what they called them. The, the new lights were the people that said, okay, we have a new teaching, a new doctrine, we're going to go to the halfway covenant. And the old lights were those old people that said, this ain't right. Come on, somebody, help me preach now. And now, if you want me to break that down into modern Christianity, if you want me to break that down into many churches today, you have one generation in the church that is tolerant about everything. Nothing's wrong. Conviction is not good because it makes you feel bad. And you've got the old people that said, Dear God, we need a revival because half these people are backslid coming to church. Oh, it got quiet there. I don't know if I got the, I don't know if I got a halfway covenant bunch. I don't know if I got new lights or old lights in the house. So let me, do I have any old lights in the house? Bless his name. So here's what happened eventually. Eventually, the older people in the church who really had an experience with God, and it doesn't mean they weren't younger, but I'm saying you see the division. You see how that would cause a division. They began to pray. Now, Jonathan Edwards, who started the Reformation, I'm sorry, the Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards, who started the Great Awakening, who preached that message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, and had had, I don't know how many, I've got the, I've got the numbers here, thousands saved, it was his granddad who came up with the halfway covenant. And he realized, wait a minute, people need to really convert. And so God gave him a message. And he what I have heard he was a his, historically he wasn't some dynamic preacher. He was a monotone preacher that preached like this and pretty much looked down because he couldn't see well and read his notes and in the centers of the hands of an angry God and you will be like a spider in a web that's hanging over the candle flames and burning. And he just as he just looked down and preached, people start wailing and screaming and running to the altar. Come on, somebody. And it was an awakening. And it's, it's known as one of the greatest simple... One of the greatest messages ever preached in a season of America 
And the book, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and that message is still talked about to this day. So let's, let's, let's take this for a moment and look at something that's very important because I'm going to bring this out later probably. There, you cannot put new wine in an old bottle. Some people use that verse to get rid of the old people in a church. That is not what it's talking about. An old wine skin gets dry. An old wine skin, if you try to put new wine in it and fermentation happens, it cracks it and breaks it and leaks out. But you don't throw away the wine skin that's dry. You know how you, what you do? You take water and salt water and you dip it in salt water to get the bacteria out and then you take olive oil. Mm -hmm. True story. And you rub it down and rub it down till the dryness leaves <clears throat> and the oil makes it pliable again. Does anybody understand that? So we, you, if, if you're older and you're dry, you don't just sit there and remain dry. If you want the new that God is doing, you have to get ready, renew the wineskin. You have to renew your mind. When, if revival looks different than the way you saw it, renew your mind. If church looks a little different, but God is moving, renew your mind. Uh, I'm going to go there in a minute. Now, the second great awakening from 1790 to the 1840s. Now, here's what happened. During that time frame, and we're talking about America. We're not talking about other nations. But during that time frame, the West opened up. And how many remember the Wild Wild West? One of my favorite shows years ago with that guy doing all those tricks up his sleeve. Uh, and so the Wild West, that's, it was called the Wild West for a reason. So people began to move and begin to settle in the Midwest and the western part of the United States. And they, as you know, they went in wagon trains. You've seen all the movies. However, they brought with them whiskey, prostitutes, and there was killing and stealing on a consistent basis. It's one of those few places that if somebody made you mad, you just faced them off in the street, and whoever could kill the other one first won. Those were real. That's not in movies. That really happened, okay? <laughs> I had a friend of mine that put up a tent in the 1960s in Harlan County, Kentucky. In Harlan County, they used to call it Bloody Harlan. How many, do I have any Kentucky people here that know I'm telling the truth? They, did they used to call Harlan County in the 40s, 30s and 40s, 50s, 50s, Bloody Harlan because there were so many people. There was a lot of violence, a lot of alcohol, a lot of violence. It was a, it was a rough place. And my friend said, I saw it with my own eyes. Two guys were armed, walking around, and they made each other mad, and they went in the street and drew and shot each other. I said, that's the wild, wild west. He said, that's why they called it Bloody Harlan right there was for the very thing. So in other words, you know, it, it was bad in the west. The west was bad. Ministers in the southeast, some of them had never read a Bible. Never read, listen, never read a Bible or even knew a verse that they could quote out of it. And especially their people. There was a lot of uneducation back then. We know that. A lot of ignorance. And some people could not read. But people did not know the scriptures whatsoever. During this time frame, there were uh, cults rising. Universalists, Unitarians, Deists. And they started rejecting Christianity. They were the more intellectual from your universities and your scholars. And so all of a sudden, traditional Christianity seems to be going out the window. There was immorality, there was vice, and it was common in all states. Now, let me tell you what started shaking the United States. Now, it ended up being a negative thing later, but it was a positive thing for years. In the 1840s, there was a massive revival of the preaching of prophecy. There were books written by the droves, and there were different organizations that had written books on the Lord is coming, and they started even putting dates out there. Now, let me tell you what happened. It shook people up like you would believe. However, somebody say however. however. When the date came to pass and nothing happened, what did they do? Did you know, did you know Bill Cloud got saved Reading a book. It was not a Perry Stone book, which it was. I could claim him for the kingdom of God and maybe get something in my crown one day, you know. But Bill, was, Bill, Bill followed our ministry from the very early stages. But do you, know, do you know what Bill got saved reading? 88 reasons why Jesus will come in 1988. 
Anybody remember that book? Did anybody remember the, the Sunday before it was supposed to happen, how packed your church was? And the pastor, we were up in Maryland. It was a, they're, all, they're all showing up. What's Brother Stone think? What's Brother Perry think? That Perry Stone, he preaches prophecy. What's he think? I said, I think you better get here because if Jesus comes, you're going to go to hell and burn. <laughs> and I'm telling you, they, they, but, but when it didn't happen, what happens? You set back. So the prophecy preaching temporarily stirred people up with their attention to God, but then when the dates did not work out, which they did in 1844, 1842, and so on, then they began to back away from it, and some of the folks changed their doctrine, of course, after that. So what I want to tell you is that the United States and the West was in horrible shape for many, many years, and carnality and, and money and the love of money and the love of gold and the gold rush. Let me tell you how bad it got during the gold rush. During the gold rush, a lot of men went out west. And a lot of the times they didn't take their whole family because it was rough. You had to live very rough. You lived a very rough life. And, th and this was on one of America's main networks only, only to show what it was like. It wasn't an anti-gay uh, thing. It was to show what it was like. But what happened was during Saturday nights, men would get alcohol. They had alcohol. They put, guys would bring it in. They'd pay for it. And a man would dress up like a woman. And those men would have relations with another man dressed like a woman because there were no women out there. Now, some, now some cities and towns had prostitutes. But if you're out there by yourself, that actually began to happen. Now, this is the kind of culture. Now, get ready for what I'm going to tell you. This is the kind of culture that is ready for revival. You would think that God becomes angry, takes his hand off, lets something happen. That can happen. But when it gets really low and it gets really bad and people are wigging out doing crazy stuff, you can just shake your head and say, we're getting ripe. Wait a minute. Not for judgment. We're getting ripe for a move of God. We're, we're getting ripe. We're getting ripe for God to come down and save a bunch of people. And I want you to remember this. God never in the Bible visited in judgment till he visited in extreme mercy first. And we're now in. We're not in the judgment cycle. Some of these things like tornadoes are natural disasters. It's not God out there trying to kill everybody because good people end up getting hurt. It rains on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. So it's not whether they're bad or good. Right now, we are in the time of the dispensation of the church age, the dispensation of the grace of God. We're not in the tribulation yet. We're not in the time of the wrath of God yet. And because of that, we can say today that we are ripe for God, I feel the Holy Spirit. Let's put our hands up for a minute. Glory to God. Woo! We are ripe for God to do something, to send something our way. Praise God. In 1787 through, through 18, uh, I'm sorry, through 1789, the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, see this is the whole family of preachers, started another awakening at Hampton Sydney College, there was a great move of God. At the same time, Charles Finney, a great, one of the great evangelists in American history, comes to the scene. So now you have a second wave taking place. Watch this. Finney had a half a mi million people converted to Jesus. Woo! James McGreedy from Kentucky. Now, now, who's from Kentucky? I know she's from, who's from Kentucky here. Anybody from Kentucky? I'm having a hard time seeing it. Just one person, two people. Now, let me tell you something about Kentucky. In American history, Kentucky has always been the state that has revival on the East Coast. Historically, and I'm going to tell you why, because Kentucky has always had hungry people in it. They're different than the West Virginians. They're close connected. They're different from the Southwestern Virginias. They have their own, they have their own uh, personality, but they've always been very family-oriented. But Kentucky, okay, this man baptized 8,000 in the Jasper River during a great revival. Here's another one, the Cane Ridge Revival. Do you know where Cane Ridge happened? Kentucky. 
another revival. Barton Stone, no relation, had a great emotionally charged revival at Cane Ridge. There was slain in the spirit, laughing, crying, people going into trances. And this is before. Now, listen, there are, there are no restaurants. There are no restrooms. That would panic me right there. <laughs> there are no restaurants. There are no hotels. You came with a wagon or a tent, and you camped outside and cooked outside. And 25,000 people showed up. One revival. Whew, my God. Those who followed the move of God grew in the Lord. Those who rejected the revival were left behind and they in their churches spiritually died. That's the pattern of every revival and every awakening. Now here's what I want to tell you. We're going to get into what I want to talk about now. Cane Ridge... And the revivals in Kentucky preceded the Civil War in 1861. As a matter of fact, if you will check it out, Southwest Virginia, some of West Virginia, especially the coal mining area and up through the, through the middle of it, especially Eastern Kentucky, Parts of Tennessee, if you will look at it, you will discover something very strange about those states. You will discover that revivals were continually breaking out in those areas before the Civil War. I would like to explain this to you from what I feel like the Lord gave me. The reason was that when the Civil War broke out, a large majority of those who were in the Confederate Army, and we could say Union as well, but in the Confederate Army were husbands and sons from those states. Do you know why they selected? They did it in Vietnam too. They did, no, I'm sorry. They did it in the Korean War. My daddy told me about it. The reason the U.S. military went to Kentucky and West Virginia and Tennessee and Virginia is because all of those boys were raised to hunt with a gun by their daddy. And they could, they could take a squirrel out in a tree. They'd see a deer at a distance and they'd calculate the wind and they, they, could, they were deer hunters. And they were the best marksmen. That's why when Andy Jackson came through, he wanted all of his people that he was getting to come from those mountaineers. Do you know why? Because he knew they were the best shooters. Let me tell you what God knew. God, I feel the anointing talking about this. Whew. God knew that a lot of people were going to die. And he did two things. He broke out a revival so these boys that would later be men that were going to go fight would hear the gospel. Thousands of people just in Cane Ridge alone. Because he did not want them going to war dying lost. In the Civil War, in a divided nation, 620,000 were killed. But in the Union and in the Confederacy, what history does not tell you, we focus on the war, the reason it came, the social part of it. We've always done that. That's all we know in history. Did you know that the records show that as the Civil War went on, 300,000 accepted Jesus and were baptized in water? Soldiers. You could not go into a Union camp or a Confederate camp. And history, there's men that wrote about this. You won't read about it much in history. You can find it if you look for it. But you couldn't go into a camp without men before battle, singing hymns and men baptized, being baptized in a shallow creek or a horse trough. That's what Nick baptizes people in. Think about it. So what, what was God doing? Say it. He was preparing people to hear the word
and have knowledge before they ever stepped on the battlefield so that instead of being lost, if they died, they would enter the kingdom of heaven. Is everybody tracking with me so far? In 1896 in Murphy, in 1900 in Kansas, in 1906 in Azusa Street, why were there three areas in the United States where that many revivals were breaking out? I, I think the answer is because in 1914, World War I broke out. And millions died. And again, many were selected from these areas where the revival would break out. Not all went to war, but many, many did. Whew. I did a book. I think, I'm not sure which one it's in. I apologize for not being able to tell you. Uh, I've even forgotten the books I've written. That's pretty bad. <laughs> I was in uh, another state during COVID for a, a period of time and I just began to write. Uh, I don't write diaries. I don't write, write memoirs or diaries or what's happening or what I'm going. I don't do that because I don't want to leave a record of anything the devil did. I want to leave a record of what God did. I don't want the devil to get an ounce of credit or, or think he had a victory anywhere. So sometimes I won't tell all the, the crazy stuff as much. I was in an area in which I'd had a dream many years ago. I was, well, I'll just tell you. I think I've told you already. But I was in the state of California. It was the only place open that I could go to to get the help I needed. I mean, Mayo Clinic was closed. My my clinic up in the mountains said we, we don't, we're not taking anybody because of COVID it was shut down and I said what am I going to do and, and we found a place and I had a dream years ago three of them of a tsunami coming across the coast and I happened to be about a half a mile from the coast and I was on a balcony every day looking saying is this the day <laughs> The owner was not a Christian. He, his daddy had been raised uh, in the Catholic church and he, just, he saw some things from his daddy, not from the church, but from his dad, really bothered him growing up. And so he, he just didn't care about church. So I told him my dream. That night he had a dream of a tsunami. Then I was really worried. I said, God, if you're telling an unsaved man something's gonna happen, get me out of here before it happens, please. <laughs> It was during that time the Lord showed me something that I never put together. In April, in April of 1906, there was some rumblings that were taking place in California that people were not paying attention to. And in those rumblings, suddenly came an earthquake. And that earthquake in California became known as the worst disaster in American history called the San Francisco earthquake. 3,000 died Buildings were completely decimated. Gas lines broke. Fires were everywhere. It was horrible if you ever see the pictures. I was in a bookstore many years later. San Francisco earthquake, the inside story. Little old book, little old book. Printed about 1908 to 1910, somewhere in there. Don't remember the exact date. And the opening paragraph talked about the sudden earthquake and the author who was not a Christian to my knowledge, it was not a prophetic book, it was a historical document by a journalist said, and many considered it to be the judgment of God. I couldn't believe it. I thought if a journalist were to say that today, they would take their license from them and call them a fear monger. And I thought about that book and I'm, I'm typing and then I realized, oh my goodness, that was the trigger to Azusa Street. And I started researching. Because when San Francisco got hit in April, the Los Angeles papers were warning, we might be next. And everybody reading the paper 
became fearful. And they start saying, what if? And that's when the prayer meetings started. That's when Seymour got there. The people were praying. Read it. It wasn't just a revival. They were having prayer meetings all night. Do you know why? Because they thought that any month, any week, or any day, Los Angeles would shake and thousands of people would be dead under the rubble. And the fear of a quake caused hearts to be open to where when Azusa Street came, thousands in a building half the size of this building had a revival that went on for year after year after year because people said, what if? Let me tell you what's happening now by the Spirit of God. Why suddenly, out of the clear blue, does Asbury College have an awakening? Major. Look, you know, you know why they had to shut the thing down? You couldn't get through the street. They didn't have restrooms. They didn't have restaurants, and 50,000 people showed up. Now, some people criticize those 50,000 people, half of them adults showing up, but I'm going to tell you what it showed me. Somebody's hungry. Amen. Hallelujah. That should tell you, folks, this nation has people that are saying, God, do it again. Asbury College has been the center of awakenings three or four times in history. It starts there. And that's why, again, I'm saying we're in another pattern. We're in another cycle. And only the Lord knows where this will go and what is about to happen. But I'm telling you, we still have to see one more thing happen before the rapture. There's one, the gospel's already been preached around the world. That's happening, Matthew 24, 14. One more thing is the Joel 2 outpouring of the Holy Spirit where sons and daughters are going to prophesy and old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. And it says that there will be sign, the sign of this coming is blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And have you seen the number of volcanoes going off? 27 the other day. All over the world. We are on the verge of something. But I want to show you this. Here's, here, and, and follow me, guys. Thank you so much. Revival, God's warning to the nations. He does not send, according to Joel 2 and Acts 2, he does not send the tribulation until he first sends revival. Sons and daughters shall prophesy, old men will dream dreams, young men shall see visions, and upon your servants and your handmaids in those days, saith God, I will pour in my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It happens before the tribulation ever comes. And he gives you signs to say, now when you see the signs, when you see them happening, just write down, mark down two things are going to happen in the earth. <laughs> I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, including sons and daughters. Now that's great. I have a daughter and I have a son. And they're both under 35 years of age. But I happen to be an older person. And I don't want to be left out of this. So God went ahead and added a verse for me. And upon my servants and my handmaids in those days. I'm telling you, you and I are not about to be left out. God didn't leave us out. Put your hands together and bless him right now. Now, I'm going to give you four notes, and I want you to get ready for this, because when this revival comes to your area, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to deal with four things. Number one, 
Many revivals in history have always begun with young people. Yeah. Every revival I ever had, I'm going to talk about them in a minute, they started with young people. That's how the revival started. Then it spread to the adults. Number two, revivals are birthed through heavy intercession, conviction, and prayer. God will start convicting his church before he can convict the sinners. He has to get his own church in order. Set your house in order, he said. Number three, and here's the part that I've got to talk about. Revivals are disruptive to the routine and that's why they don't last long normally. I spent the evening with Lyndall Cooley this past, uh, was it this past weekend, honey? I've lost track of time. And went to his church to preach. And Lyndall has a great church there out in, in the Nashville area. And I had the honor of sitting with a man for hours for him to tell me all about the Brownsville revival that you haven't heard anybody preach. And I asked him, I said, that thing went on so long, but why did it end? I said, I, you know, from what I've heard, and he began to tell me the changes and transitions, and Steve Hill wanted to preach out more, and, and people were asking John Kilpatrick to do, um, a, 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 you know, revival. Take it out of Brownsville. We can't go to Brownsville. He said a lot of it was the transition that took place. But I will tell you something he told me that I experienced myself. He said the thing that began to happen was when the revival started, everybody in the church seemed excited. The crowd started coming and people said, wow, do you see all the new people in the church? This is great. And that was the first four or five weeks. And then people had to work and try to get to church while crowds were standing outside where they normally walk in. And then they went to find their parking spot and couldn't find it because somebody had got it before them. And then the, the people began to calculate how much toilet paper was being used. Oh, let me calculate that for you in my conferences. You wouldn't believe it. Then there was the air conditioning. This was a big building. They had to keep the air on nonstop. And then when the winter months come, they had to put the, put the heat on nonstop. And elders and deacons finally said, you know, we're losing control of our church. This is our church. And I can't get in my favorite seat. And when it was over, the church that John Kilpatrick started pastoring when revival broke didn't even exist. It was a whole new group. Now listen to me. You have to understand, and I'm trying to get this in your spirit, and I believe the Lord wants me to, to get this in everybody's spirit. No matter where you go to church, okay, no matter where you go, no matter... Who you, you know, a lot of you, a lot of you come on Tuesday nights with us. Thank you for that on Dr. Cutshaw and myself. Uh, thank you for that. And some of you have other congregations, but you participate in all of our conferences when they come. Thank you for that. But I'm going to tell you, wherever you go to church, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up in a minute, but listen to me. We pray for revival, but when it comes, we're really not ready. In 1981, I was just a kid preacher. I wasn't married yet, and I started a revival in Pulaski, Virginia. In that town, when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years of age, Radford, Fairlawn, Pulaski, Withville, and Dublin, I preached to more than 20,000 people. Not at one time, but all the churches. It may be more than that. I, I, they were, when Perry Stone, as a kid, would come to preach... It was my favorite place to preach because of this. When I went to preach, you might as well, Katie, bar the door. There will be no place to park anywhere on the property, and there'll be not one seat in the building. And so we had a revival that broke out. I never will forget a couple things. I never will forget a blind woman whose optic nerve was burned out with surgery getting healed after prayer, and God put an optic nerve back in her eyeball. Miss Thacker. Jackie Thacker's mother, who's a friend of mine, and she stayed healed till she died. Greatest, greatest miracle I ever saw. Greatest miracle. 
An atheist professor took a tape and translated the message from tongues. I was speaking in an, an Aramaic language that is old, that doesn't even exist today, that Abraham spoke, and he knew it because he was from Syria where it was originated. That happened. The craziest things you've ever saw in your life, signs and wonders happening. One night, oh, I'd love to see this again. The Pulaski County High School showed up, the whole school. At least it looked like it. 450 young people from one school. They were all over. I said, where's the high school tonight? They all, I said, stand up. I said, line up on that wall and all the way back there and all the way through there because I'm going to pray for you. And as I started laying hands on them, every one of them fell under, every one of them fell under the power. It wasn't me. It was the Spirit of God. And it was so large, I had to go, in, watch this, into the lobby. Then they kept coming. I had to go down the hall on the outside between. Then I had to go back down the back hall. And then I had to go out, come back out this door. And I'm telling you, I, I never saw so many people getting prayed for in my life. I think we prayed for 500 that night. And it looked like a, it looked like a bomb had gone off. And kids were, were just moving under the power of God. They were crying. They were repenting. And here's what's sad. The older people didn't like it. And one of, the, one of the men, I've never forgot this, I was told this later, stood in the back when people who were visiting walked in and shook their hand and say, what you're about to see tonight is not normal. We'd love to have you come and visit us back when things get back to normal. And this Methodist couple told that usher, the reason we're visiting tonight, we live here and we've heard it's not normal and that's what we're looking for. <laughs> We don't want normal. We can get normal anywhere. We want something that's not normal. Everything's normal. Oh, whoa. Oh, God. And sadly enough, after 150 people saved and at least that many baptized in the Holy Spirit and people coming from counties, just driving in from counties every night, and drugs, this is a fact, drugs were shut down in three counties. They couldn't get kids to sell drugs in the school or Radford University. Couldn't find them. They were successful in getting me run out of town. The drug dealers. I found it out 10 years later. Never knew, and I'm not going to go into that story. But I've seen it. I've seen how when God gets, look, revival gets messy when God shows up. Telling you. Then I go, I go down here to Daisy, Tennessee. This is right before Pam and I were married. And that revival broke out and went uh, seven and a half weeks. Every night, seven and a half weeks. Got a call from the principal to take it out of the church into the high school. But we knew it would change the atmosphere if I did that. We, we chose not to do it. Over 600 people were filled with the Holy Ghost and 500 saved. All these young preachers that are pastoring churches in Alabama, Tony McAfee up here in Tennessee, all those young boys come in in that revival either got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and called to preach. So many of them, I can't even count them on both hands. But guess what happened? Guess what happened? If you weren't there by 4 o'clock, you didn't get a seat usually. I'm talking about during the week. All these miracles... Dragging a woman in dying with cancer. Laid hands on her. They drug her out. I mean, they literally drug her. They, she, they, she had planned her funeral. And two days later, we find out that she goes back to the doctor because she feels better. And she can't, they can't find any cancer from her head to her feet. To God be the glory. To God be the To God be the glory. But guess what happened? There's a group of people there. Didn't like it. And they're the very ones who bragged on, we've been praying for years for revival. No, you want revival to look like you want it to look like. And when these drug addicts start coming in and these, these alcoholics start coming in, they didn't want them in the church because they didn't have money. They wanted, they wanted you to have revival, but get the business guy saved. Third meeting, Tennessee, right here in Tennessee. La Follette, Tennessee, and I know I'm naming places. And by the way, good people came out of all these revivals who are still saved, who are in their 50s and 60s now. So I don't want to leave it like somebody disrupted something and didn't, God didn't do his work, he did. 
La Follette, Tennessee, kind of a strange situation. The pastor called me and said, I'm probably going to leave here. I said, why am I coming for revival? He said, well, we just need a revival, so come on, let's see what happens. Well, uh, 11 weeks later, <laughs> same thing started happening. 450 saved, uh, at least that many baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean to tell you, it was, it was absolutely unbelievable. 280 new people joined the church. That's half of this crowd right now. No, no, it's maybe three quarters of this crowd right here. I don't know how many's here. Join the church. I'd get up to preach and say, sir, you back there with the green jacket on, would you stand up? And he'd be a Baptist deacon from First Baptist. I didn't know who he was. I said, if you'll take three steps toward me, just take three steps, the Spirit of God's going to baptize you. And he'd go, uh -huh, uh -huh. and he went one, two, three. Bam, like something hit him. And his wife just over there shaking and here comes another one over here. and Yeah, yeah, we saw it happening. But instead of being happy, 80 people in that church did not want the pastor to stay and were afraid that the longer I stayed, and the, I, this is a true story, and the more people that joined the church, he would now have new people who would accept his ministry and the old people called right here in Cleveland, Tennessee and told the, no, they told the state of receiver and the general receiver, you have this meeting shut down or 80 of us is going to leave the church. I felt like saying goodbye. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you, okay, on your way out. Sorry, you can edit that out if you want to. And I had to watch, again, a woman walk in, some of you have heard me tell this, a, a woman walked in the office and wanted to see me and Pam. What was this, about the eighth week, maybe eighth week of the revival, ninth? And start, looked at me, a member of the church, she was a younger lady, probably about, what, 35 maybe, 30, 35? And she said, you ain't of God. Looked at me. Well, look, I've been preaching for about 14 weeks, and you don't look at a guy preaching 14 weeks and tell him he ain't of God because you better hope the spirit of Elijah don't come on him and him slap you sideways. <laughs> and I'm sitting there getting ready to say, is this, re is this really happening? Does someone have the audacity to come in here after I fast till I can't even sleep and praying all day, you telling me I'm not of God? And I jumped up and told her. But I didn't have to because the moment I got up, that little lady who is very quiet, my wife, that you never see lose her temper, she said, let me tell you something, sister. I told my husband he is stupid for staying at this church and having a revival because of the way you people are acting around here. I live with this man and he fasts and prays all day. Don't you dare come in here and don't you dare tell my husband he's not of God. You ain't of God. That's what the problem is. You're not of God. And that lady went, <laughs> and I said, why would you even say that? She said, because the older people are not coming to this revival. And I just assumed if they weren't coming, there must be something they knew. I said, I'm going to tell you what I know. They don't want the pastor here. That's what I know. And they're a bunch of belligerent, hard-headed, stiff-necked people. And if you follow them, you ain't going to have no victory in your life. See, I was a lot bolder back then. I wouldn't say that today. I just said, well, God bless you. Hallelujah. Go on. <laughs> Three revivals. And when they started, everybody was ready. The whole town got excited. But when it came to being tired, got to come every night. If I don't come, what will they say? We need to shut this down because we got too many. They were all, well, two, two, one, one, two of them, one of them I had to leave because I had more meetings. And another one, I just got tired and told them I couldn't carry on. We could have carried on, but we didn't. But the other one was shut down. Can I tell you something? The last long revival I preached, I preached a five week at North Cleveland Church of God. Was anybody in that one? Well, we went Sunday through Wednesday for five weeks. And then I preached 
for Jensen Franklin five weeks. Now, Jensen was the one church. I'm going to say this to his benefit. Jensen's church was the one church where six over five to 600 were saved, saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and they followed up on those people, and the church grew immediately because of the revival. Can I tell you the difference? Because his people have a good spirit because he ain't going to put up with your mess. That's my friend Jensen. He ain't going to put up with your mess. No, you're going to complain. You might as well leave. And so because of their spirit, God sent them the meeting, and he actually built that new church. We were in the old church. He built the new church, and it was one of the greatest meetings. But, but I quit having long meetings, can I tell you? Could, I, I could have had them for years, but I kept finding out that my wife's heard me tell this. They never were ready. They didn't know what to do. New people are coming in. Look, when you have a whole room full of new babies in a nursery, you've got to change diapers and burp them. Some people didn't want to do that. They wanted their comfort zone. So I asked this question. Why did God tell William Branham in 1959 at Faith Memorial where Pastor Littlefield was pastoring? And Littlefield told me this himself 30 years ago. It's, it's been over 30, hasn't it, probably, honey? About 30. About 30. Told me this himself. He said, I had Brother Branham come. It was 1959 in the month of June. By the way, that same month in 1959, a little boy was born named Perry Stone. <laughs> Just a coincidence, I'm sure. June of 1959, Brother Branham got up and basically told the people at Faith Memorial, he said, the Lord came to me, the angel of God came. Now, when he said it, he wasn't faking. He really had an angel of God that would come to him and said to me that before the Lord's return, before, he may have even actually used the term rapture, but he said, before the Lord returns, God told me that Cleveland, Tennessee is going to be the hub of the final end time revival. And Brother Littlefield held on to that. And I've, I've told that word for many, many years. The hub. It sounds to me like it's not just saying that there'll be a revival come, but a revival spirit is going to be <sighs> so strong and that people are going to come in just to be revived and refreshed. And, and then I realized one day, I've, I've been waiting for this, but God says, what do you think happens about eight times a year at Omega Center? They come from all over the United States. For what? Main event. It's a camp meeting, prophetic summit. It's teaching. But they're Karen, Bill, Judy Jacobs. There are four ministries using that building. And tens of thousands are coming now. Can I tell you this? I stand to be corrected. I don't know of any building in America right now that has that many ministries conducting their own conference in, one, in the same facility. Some of y'all are getting what God told me to tell you. Some of you are saying, oh my. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's been happening all along. We've expected a 29, 35 month revival, a three year revival every night. God's saying, no, it's a hub. Yeah. It's a center. Watch. He told me, he said, Perry, a hub is a center. And he said, the name of your building is Omega Center. Wow. International. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan that goes beyond that into this move of the spirit that he wants to send. 
But I say, and I'm, God, I'm trying to wrap this up. But I say to myself, why here? What is there about here that God would say, okay, of all places, then I hear, why Jerusalem? Jerusalem is where the temple was, but it's where they gathered every seven times a year, right, to come to Jerusalem, or three times a year. They gathered to come to Jerusalem, to the temple. Okay, I get that. But the temple is the center of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of Israel. This is true. And Israel is the center of the nations. And the first thing the Lord tells me to tell you from Cleveland, Tennessee here, and you that are connected with the ministry, is the reason Cleveland, it's centralized. Nick, come up here. Okay. When you talked, come on up here with me. When you, you and I talked and you said that I told you, I said, we may have an opportunity for you to come to Cleveland. Uh -huh. Do you remember what I told you about evangelizing out of Cleveland? Yes. What was it? You said we're within eight hours of every major city on the East Coast. Basically, I was telling mm -hmm. you it's centralized. Yes. In other words, if you headquarter here, mm -hmm. you're only a few hours from Charlotte, a few hours from Atlanta, a few hours from mm -hmm. Nashville. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Knoxville. The majority... Yeah. Of the cities on the East Coast, all the way to the Mississippi, mm -hmm. are the same, are within seven hours of Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most centralized areas. Why do you think God poured his spirit out in Murphy and had them move here? I don't know if you know this. Billy Graham went to school one year in Cleveland, Tennessee. First year of school. Right here. Right here. Bob Jones University. Now Lee. Right here. We have, and I said to the Lord, what is there about this little town, this county? And he says, it's wells. There were wells dug by old people, old timers. They prayed all the time. The Church of God of Prophecy had a tabernacle here at one time, and they had 10,000 people coming into that tabernacle, Right? Whose church you got a prophecy here? You, you all remember that if you're from town? Yes. And they had it, they, they, they tore the building down a while back because of some fire issues, and I don't want to get into that. Church got a prophecy headquarters. Church of God World Headquarters. Lee University, major Christian university. Church, a school of theology, a major school of theology. Wait a minute. Perry Stone Ministries is here. And then Judy Jacobs Ministries is here. And then, my, then Mike Shreve's Ministries was here. H. Richard Hall used to be here before he went to be with the Lord. Folks. Huh? Phil, Phil Yeah, Phil Driscoll was here. I'm Norval. Norval Hayes. Think about it. Are you all hearing this? We've been a hub for a long time. And the Lord wanted me to tell you today two, three things. Don't go looking for what's already there. We're having... Listen, I, I forgot Warrior Fest. 30,000 young people have got filled with the Holy Ghost in Warrior. Are you kidding me? Is that revival? Oh, that's outpouring, brother. That's outpouring. We're not done with Warrior Fest, by the way. Pop, Pop's got to get his strength back, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get enough strength one of these days. I'm going to run every bench in that building and jump on it like I used to <laughs> while the ushers hold on to my pants so I don't break a leg. Can y'all get this? We don't need to be waiting for what's already here. It's, it's among us. What we... Oh, what we have to do is what that prophecy in the barn, Mark Casto was here, eight or, maybe eight to ten young people, it's all been written down, what God told us to do a long time ago, he said, be a guardian of the sacred fire. That's all we got to do. We got to guard the old time anointing and the Pentecostal anointing and the gifts and just protect it. <laughs> and if we do, God will find the hungry. And here's what he says. This is number two. 
It is his will for Cleveland, Tennessee to be a place that is a continuous revival center. Like when people know they need prayer, they can come. So, there'll be churches here. You can get prayer for the sick. There'll be churches here that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is breaking out. And number three, he said to tell you that all these meetings that are starting to break out right now is a sign of something that's going to happen big. And you will remember my statement one day. It may be years. Something big that's going to happen. The enemy... And the enemy's sly. I don't know if you understand how sly the enemy is. But the enemy is sly to try to always disrupt, however he can do it, God's plan. But I want you to remember, God always lets the devil move first. And you think the enemy's got the edge. And you think he's whipped it. And you think it's done. And if you just sit back, lay back, do nothing, say nothing. God will come through and I, he will come through and he will get the glory for what he does.